The podcast was an idea of mine while I was still on active duty in the United States Navy because I enjoyed podcasts at the time and still do. And I knew there were always a lot of people who were very fascinated in military aviation. When they would meet me from time to time, we would have a chance to chat about it and they just loved everything about it. So I decided to share this fascinating world with everyone in this particular media and I enjoy doing it. The, um, it's given me new opportunities to meet people like you, Mike, and your followers. I've had other people reach out to me. It's been a lot of fun. And I just keep sharing this information as long as people show up to hear it. And I hope they enjoy what they hear. So with that, Mike, I'm going to switch over to, let's see. Oh, here's the live Q&A. Got it. All right. So, Mike, uh, let's see if I can do this right. I don't have two. I'll have to switch back and forth. But uh, let's see what we can see here. So yes, here you five by five. Hi there. What is the fastest you've been in a Hornet is the first question I see. Uh, the fastest I've been in a Hornet was Mach 1.6. It was carrying no extra fuel tanks or stores, not even any pylons to attach those stores. And I started up at about 45,000 feet, got to Mach 1.2 in full afterburner, and then pitched the nose down to about 45 degrees and stayed in that attitude as long as I could stand it. And I think I saw Mach 1.6. I did hit Mach 1.93 in an F-16. That was a lot of fun as well. Uh, what is the most difficult adversary you've tackled? Well, probably when I was an adversary, tackling another F-18, uh, frankly. But the F-22, when I was an adversary, I got to fight one of them. And that was pretty impressive. But from the blue air perspective, probably any of the advanced threats in the form of the flankers and some of the Chinese aircraft that are out there. Uh, last question from the Freckle Puny is, and what's the deal with those canted out pylons on the Super Hornet? Great question. The story as I know it, may or may not be true, was that they, in development, were having some wing flutter problems. And so the engineers decided that if they just canted the pylons out about four degrees, that it took care of the wing flutter and hence the stress problem that they were having. And they swear up and down, the engineers and Boeing do, that it doesn't degrade performance, but we in the cockpit, we all know the difference. Once you start hanging big stores out there like fuel tanks and whatnot, it increases your drag and decreases your acceleration uh, quite noticeably. So apparently it was a stopgap Band-Aid measure, and unfortunately now we have to live with it. All right, uh, the episode with Willie Driscoll was awesome. Thank you very much. I enjoyed that episode as well. Yeah, I appreciate that. We have hopefully more good ones coming for you. Uh, from Tony S. Jello, would you choose the F-18 or F-16 to take in the battle? Uh, Tony, for me, the F-18, and that's because I have far more experience in that aircraft. I just know it better. If I were to today get called back and be asked to go into combat and they put me in an F-16, well, first off, it would take quite a bit of refresher training. But secondly, I just wouldn't be as comfortable because I don't have the depth of experience and we're talking 3,300 hours in an F-18 versus about 170 hours in an F-16. So for me, uh, definitely a Hornet. If you took someone who spent maybe half their career in the Navy and then got out and went to the reserves and flew the F-16 and they flew the F-18 in the Navy, they probably would have a different question, a different answer. But for me, definitely the F-18. Uh, Griffin, when Hornet enters a, quote, falling leaf, the pilot must remove feet and hands from the controls. Does the flight control system move the controls to recover the aircraft or do they stay neutral? So good question, Griffin, just for everyone's background, the falling leaf, as the name implies, when you ever see a leaf fall off a tree, it kind of waddles back and forth on its way down. The F-18, because of its center of gravity and its flight controls and its dimensions, when it departs controlled flight, it used to be very prone to getting into a falling leaf type parameter. And I don't recall all the exact, you know, pitch differences and rate of descent, et cetera. With recent, and by recent, I mean the last 10 years or so, flight control software upgrades, the falling leaf is less likely. But if it does enter it, or if it did then, uh, Tony Griffin, excuse me, to answer your question, the flight controls would do what the computers felt was needed to get the aircraft out of that. So you might see the leading edge flaps extend to their maximum deflection. You might see the trailing edge flaps move up and down in the rudders. And at that point, you're along for the ride. Uh, but it used to be that we had certain procedures that we would do, for example, a stick full forward to help the aircraft if we were upright, stick aft if we were inverted. And that was, again, 
just trying to convince the flight computer, hey, this is what we think we need. But in reality, at that point, we're just a voting member. So great question, Griffin. From Richard, what's the G limit on the Hornet? Uh, 7.5. Does the fly-by-wire stop you overstressing the jet? No, it's supposed to, but there are different ways you can overstress the jet. And it's usually a bad thing when you do. One is a rolling pull. If you are literally turning and pulling at the same time, that can overstress the aircraft. <clears throat> Excuse me. Another is if you pull too quickly, a lot of times the G limiter cannot keep up with you. And that is how I once inadvertently pulled 8.4 Gs. And what's another way? If you are pulling, let's say 7.5 and you inadvertently go through some wake turbulence or someone's jet wash, that quick spike in the air can also cause an overstress. So for the most part, the jet will save you. Sometimes if you ham fist it, as we say, or fly through some environmental disturbances, you could end up overstressing. Uh, let's see. That's a complicated name I won't try to pronounce, but hello, have you flown a Hornet with 8X or more AMRAM? Uh, no, I've not. I think the most I've ever carried was one. If so, did it struggle to acceleration when at or above Mach 1.0? Uh, so I can't answer that, but I would imagine it would just because of the parasite drag of air flowing by all those weapons. However, I can't imagine the total parasite drag is that much worse than three drop tanks and a couple stores. And I have flown in that configuration and it just feels like a big waddling hippopotamus. So it didn't perform particularly well. You had to spend most of your time up at full power, even minimum afterburner to keep the aircraft with enough knots on it so that you didn't depart controlled flight if you made a turn. Good question. Uh, from David, did you consider traps as a terror experience? Uh, the first 10 or maybe even 20 or 30, David, yes, absolutely. But as I got more experienced, the day landings became actually kind of enjoyable and the night landings I never got used to. So I wouldn't say a terror experience. Uh, the one exception being the time off of Western Australia in 2005 when the ship was moving uh, from neutral position up 20 feet and down 20 feet that I decided that that much movement at night was pretty terrifying. And I was, I was glad to be uh, back aboard after, after that particular attempt, which didn't happen on the first time. I, my first landing attempt, I missed the entire carrier. Uh, the second time I touched the carrier, but missed all the wires. And the third try, I finally got aboard. And when I walked into the ready room, everyone was sitting in there, all the other pilots watching danger TV, as we call it. And they all clapped and whistled and cat called for me to welcome me back. So that was uh, that was a lot of fun, but no, not really. Uh, from Adam, Vincent, do Navy aviators generally regard themselves as superior to Air Force pilots because they have because they have the additional challenge of carrier takeoffs and landings? Adam, I won't speak for all. I presume that some do, but humility, as hopefully you've learned if you've watched any or listened to any of my podcasts, is a big part of what we do. So I, for one, would never look over my nose at an Air Force pilot uh, for reasons I've stated in previous interviews. And that is all the time that we spend learning and, and preparing and training to land on a carrier, Air Force pilots can spend on tactics because their landings are very benign. So I by no means think of myself more highly than really any other pilot, let alone an Air Force pilot. But sure, some probably do, and they most likely have attitude problems elsewhere. So good question. From George, in an F-18, what measures would you take if you detected a missile launch such as an S-400 against you? Well, George, that's a fairly easy question, but there's so much that's missing. So, you know, what theater am I in? Am I even over enemy territory or all of a sudden am I getting shot at from somewhere that I thought was neutral or friendly? How fast am I going? What am I carrying, et cetera? But in general, the S-400, which we call something different, SA probably 10 or 20, I'm not sure, I don't remember, uh, but it's an advanced, I'm sure, surface air missile. And after taking a split second to clean my garments, I would probably uh, try to defend from that threat using expendables, chaffs and flares, uh, chaff and flares, as well as if it wasn't already turned on, maybe an onboard self-protection jammer. Uh, but all of those don't work if you don't maneuver the aircraft. So you have to hope that you have the, the necessary airspeed on the aircraft 
so that you can try to defend from it. If you recall, if you listened to my interview with Willie Driscoll from last episode, that he was talking about they got hit when they were slow and any other time when they were fast, they were able to do a turn and defeat the surface to air missile coming at them. So in that case, uh, with enough knots, you can maneuver and hopefully try to defeat the missile tracking on you in the end game because it's just going so fast, it can't handle the turn as you do a last minute or a last ditch maneuver to try to defeat it. Good questions. All right, so Mike's giving positive feedback here. That's good. Mike, we'll just keep at this for a while. And then when I, you, you may need to think ahead a couple minutes because if there's questions between, then by the time I get to your statement to wrap it up, it'll, it'll take a little bit of time. All right, from Marcel, did you have a chance to have a trip on the Super Hornet? Yes, I have about 700 hours in the Super Hornet. Uh, towards the end of my career, I flew it as much or more than the regular Hornet. So yes, several, several hundred hours in the Super Hornet. Uh, Marcel, if yes, how does it compare to the F-16 specifically, especially on turn capabilities? Um, so Marcel, the Super Hornet is better in a slow speed dogfight than the F-16, but in a slow speed dogfight where the F-16 is allowed to get its energy back, which it can do very rapidly, then the F-16 would be at the advantage. So two evenly matched pilots in a Super Hornet and an F-16 might end up in a neutral type, low energy around the circle from each other type of fight, like two children on a uh, merry-go-round. But if one makes a mistake or if one's slightly better than the other, either one could beat the other aircraft on any given day. Just there's a lot that goes into it. It's not a sure thing. Now, that being said, you take an F-16 or an F-18 uh, and put it next to, uh, you know, an aircraft maybe say as a tornado, I don't mean to pick on it, but it's not intended to dogfight really. So, you know, that, that one's going to be fairly lopsided every time. It's not going to matter much, the experience of the pilot. All right, Tony, Vincent, can you explain what life is like on the carrier when you aren't flying? It's awful. <laughs> Thanks for the question, Tony. I don't know how the people do it who aren't pilots. Um, flying off a carrier when you're deployed is the only thing that makes it sane for those of us who enjoy flying. So it's, you know, if, if we fly, let's say five or six days, and then we have a no fly day, then generally that day gets filled in by meetings and safety updates and NATOPS briefs and various things. And the NATOPS is just the big blue pill. We call it a big blue sleeping pill. It's our four inch manual, four inch thick manual that uh, has all the different procedures and emergency out, you know, procedures that you might need to do and the systems and everything else. So we, we'll, we'll do training to study for that. We will talk about what's going on in the theater we're about to enter. We might have other meetings just to handle day-to-day -day business. You might do some planning or training for something else. And then if you have a division, like again, if you listen to Willie D, you know that he was in charge of corrosion. So in that case, he would go down to his shops and hang out with his guys and find out what's going on in their world just to be a good leader, which many of us, most of us try to do. All right, from Rantam, in the interview you had here at Aircrew Interview, you said a bunch of times you're an average fighter pilot. What do you think you didn't have compared to those you considered top pilots? Thanks, Rantam. You know, a lot of that is me, frankly, not liking to toot my own horn. So as a defense mechanism against my own ego, I like to say that I'm average. Uh, certain people who know me pretty well like to beat me up, including my wife. Uh, but, you know, I, I would rather be too far that way than too far the other way, and that's just who I am. But I will say that certainly one thing that I did not have the other pilots did, and I know plenty of them who did, was the natural ability to make things look easy. For example, landing on an aircraft carrier. So I had to work really hard at it. They have every so often a little grading celebration where they take the top 10 pilots in the whole air wing, and they give them a special patch to put on their flight jackets. And some pilots will have a whole sleeve on their arm just lined up with top 10 patches. I have two. So I snuck in somehow later in my experience and was able to break into the top 10. But for the most part, I worked really hard and I just had sessions or, or stages where it was easy for that particular period of time. But for the rest of the time, I, I had to work at it. So certain people, just like in any endeavor, make things look easy. The rest of us have to work hard at it. And those of us like me who have to work hard at, we, we call ourselves average. All right, from Graham Smith. 
It just jumped on me. Stand by here, Graham. Got to come back and find you. There seems to be an increase in Hornet losses. Do you think this is down to the hours on the airframes budget or readiness cuts or something else? Yeah, I don't know, Graham. I, I'm not sure what evidence you're using to come up with that assertion. Aircraft crash, uh, I don't mean to belittle it, and certainly it's, it's tragic to those who lose their loved ones like we did this past week in Key West, but I don't particularly see an uptick in it. Now, granted, I'm a little bit removed than I used to be, but sometimes, you know, if you ever play roulette at a casino and you walk up and it shows you the history and you've seen seven or eight black in a row and you think to yourself, by golly, it's, it's got to be red. The odds are in my favor. Well, if there's no green, you know the odds of it being red next time are still 50-50 regardless of what it was in the past. So all that to be a mini statistics lesson from a former math guy on sometimes there's just clusters, sometimes there are things that happen. But to your point, and you'll hear it on this next episode on maintenance of the Fighter Pilot Podcast that launches tomorrow, uh, March 21st, the aircraft are aging, especially the F-18. Of course, the F-35, F-22 are still relatively new but they're, they're aging and they're complicated. And so sometimes like with the onboard oxygen generating system or the OBOGs, you might've read if you watch what we do that there have been a lot of issues with that in the past, for example, on the T-45 and other pressurization issues in the cockpit. So sometimes there are causes, root causes to various issues. A lot of times it's just that there are clusters and what we do is dangerous. Griffin, rudders tow in on takeoff in the Hornet. Would there be a significant difference in takeoff performance if they did not? Significant? Sure. I don't know how significant, uh, but I know that the engineers put that in there for a reason, and that is to assist with the nose pitch up at slow speeds as we are transitioning from flight to landing and from landing to flight on takeoff. So I've never had it not tow in on me, so I don't know what the difference is. But yes, the engineers put that there for a reason and it does assist during those transitional phases of flight. Good question. From Mike V, is it possible to do a low speed high AOA Cobra maneuver in a US Navy F-18? Finnish F-18s are doing it now after a series of midlife updates. Looks great when you see it at an air show. Uh, well, Mike, uh, Miko rather, I to be honest, I don't exactly remember what a Cobra maneuver is. I think it's where the nose pitches up very rapidly without the aircraft actually flying up and then going back in the direction it was going before. So we would call that an AOA excursion or an angle of attack excursion where you just reef back on the stick and make the aircraft nose point in a new direction, but you don't actually go in a new direction. So just real quickly, if anyone's not familiar, again, I'll be a good fighter pilot here and get out my hands. So if a car is driving on the road and we think of it like an aircraft, it has zero degree angle of attack. The nose and the road are pointing in the same direction. Taken to another extreme, if I am flying down the road somehow, but I'm pointing straight up, then I am at 90 degrees of angle of attack. So again, zero, 45, 90. So I think what you're talking about is the ability to do some sort of maneuver like that without actually going in that direction. Uh, it looks cool at air shows. The tactical significance of it might be somewhat less, um, but I, it's not a maneuver I'm accustomed to in the F-18. So I wish I could give you a better answer than that. All right, Richard E. The Rhino has some auto land capability on the carrier, I think. It does, so does the regular Hornet, but it's not hands-free, right? What do you know about auto land capability on the F-35C? So for the last question, nothing. I have virtually no F-35C experience other than how to spell it. Um, both the Hornet and the Rhino do have a mode one, we call it. And actually it is, Richard, hands-free. You could literally couple the aircraft, we use the word couple, couple it up or sync it up with the ship and engage the autopilot and the auto throttles. And it will take you all the way down, hands-free to a landing. The only thing you have to do is go to full power at the end in case you miss the wires. So nowadays they have magic carpet. Don't know what that means, but I'm looking to get a, get a guest on the show to talk about that in the future. Which aviation movie is your favorite and consider the most realistic? <sighs> uh, I don't know. All of them have some kookiness to them. 
Um, you know, behind enemy lines wasn't bad. There were some parts of that that were, again, a little kooky. I was going to say the final countdown, to be honest, and then I realized the ship goes through that massive time warp and goes back 50 years. If you took that part away, the rest of it was pretty realistic. Top Gun's got its issues. Iron Eagle certainly has its issues, if you remember that. <laughs> Hot Shots, uh, yeah, that's pretty realistic. Um, I don't know, the Freckle Puny. I, you're going to have to let me get back to you on that one. I'm hoping for one day a break from my normal episodes and bring back one of my past guests, and we're going to crack open a refreshment and uh, put a bunch of names of movies in a hat and pull them out one at a time and talk about highs and lows and funny parts and goofy parts on, on those movies. So I might encourage you to stay tuned and, and, and come back to the Fighter Pilot Podcast for that one. All right, Mike, thanks for the update there. All right, John Ellis, thank you for the compliment. Appreciate it. Uh, Paul, does the F-18 have any stealth capabilities or is it just jamming? Uh, no designed stealth capabilities in the regular F-18. Uh, we do have, again, some onboard self-protection jamming. And the EA-18G Growler is, of course, the electronic attack variant of the F-18. And it does have jamming capability. Jason, what kind of advice can you give to someone who aims to become an Air Force pilot? Get ready to work your butt off. Do everything you can within your reach to give yourself the best chance to do it. Talk to those who are ahead of you to get whatever information you can on the syllabus and the material. Uh, not me, I've been too far removed for too long, but someone who just went through a year or two ago. Put a smile on your face no matter what happens. Get ready to work hard, if I didn't already say that, and get ready to work hard because it is a labor of love, but it will consume you. Uh, I was dating my wife. We met right before I started flight school and she stuck around with me for five years because I told her, I said, look, I'm right now married to flight school. This is something I have to do. Uh, please hang out because I like you and you seem to like me, but right now I can't think about anything else. And we got married not long after I made it to the fleet. So I was glad she stuck around and we're still together 20 years later. But it is, it is, it is a challenge. I would get in top physical shape. I would read and study as much as you can, talk to people, listen to the podcast. Hopefully I'll help you as well and just be ready to do whatever it takes. So good luck to you, uh, Jason. Let us know how it goes. Adam, Vincent, what did you think of the movie Top Gun and the sequel they're now about to film? I love Top Gun. I think it was a great movie. I think it was brilliant that they interwove a love story in it because then when dates in the old days in the 80s, you know, took their girlfriends out to the movie, the guy's happy and the girl's happy. And still to this day, the girls, of course, love the volleyball scene and everything else. And I'm generalizing here, but bear with me. So I like the movie. It's compelling. It, I still enjoy watching it, um, although I haven't shown it to any of my kids. And so for some reason, we haven't. So we need to get that scheduled up here some Saturday night when it's raining, which isn't often in San Diego. <clears throat> uh, the sequel. Don't know that much about it. I'm fearful because all they can do is go wrong in my book. Even if it's a great movie, the best they can do is break even. About the only sequel I ever liked better than the original was Terminator 2. And so I, I think if they make an interesting show, great. But I'm just fearful with today's political and social climate. Not to say I'm an old, you know, knuckle-dragging caveman, but uh, I still cling to some traditional views. And who knows what message they may have in this and who knows where they'll take it. But if it's a good movie, I'll be glad to say I was wrong and watch it and enjoy it. So we'll see. All right, uh, given the point of the ladder is, okay, so you're already telling me. Uh, so I haven't heard that, Adam, if it is the fact that uh, Top Gun 2 is going to be about the superiority of the human pilot over, the, over US UAVs, as you put it, then again, as long as they make it an entertaining show, then hopefully we'll be in good shape. All right, from John, uh, let's see. Beth, you're about to let a bunch of people see you in your robe if you come any further this way. <laughs> All right, sorry, I uh, lost where we were. Here we go. All right, from John, thank you. Do you think the NATOPS process is an improvement over the Dash 1 for the F-16? I don't know. Uh, we, we had sort of our own F-16 NATOPS that was assimilated for Navy use and I was never familiar with the Dash 1 that the Air Force uses. So again, if I find someone in the future 
and I can remember this question who did some time in both, that would be better posed to them, but I apologize, I cannot uh, give you a, a worthwhile answer on you, for you on that one. Uh, from Toby, is there a difference in terms of creature comforts between the older and newer Nimitz carriers? Not really, Toby, they're all more or less the same. Uh, some of them now have internet connections right there in your staterooms, which is great, but for the most part, they're all pretty much the same. The only difference that I ever noticed was on the John F. Kennedy, the older one that's now retired. I think they're making another one and giving it that name, but it was conventionally powered and it was older and tired and worn out. And so that particular ship lacked a lot of the creature comforts. I can remember, no kidding, taking showers and suddenly smelling JP5, which is the fuel we use because sometimes the systems would leak into each other. So you'd get out of the shower smelling like fuel which was never any good. And sometimes there was no water because the boiler went down. So what the John F. Kennedy lacked in creature comforts, it made up for in personality. I was on that ship on December 31st, 1999. And if you were of age, you remember the big Y2K concern that they had? Well, we, uh, we, they had a big party up on the flight deck. They lowered a fake ball like in New York's Times Square that said 2000. And at the stroke of midnight, uh, the whole left or port side of the ship opened up, the uh, gunners had set up a bunch of 50 calibers and grenade launchers and pyrotechnics and they let everybody up there and kept us safe with roped off areas so we didn't fall off the ship. But at the stroke of midnight, they lit off for about two minutes of uh, shooting guns and grenades and everything. It was a lot of fun. And then of course we took January 1st off because we didn't know if Y2K was gonna affect all our aircraft, but we tested them all out and flew just fine the next day. All right. From John Nguyen, can you explain why the pylons on the Super Hornet are fitted at an angle? Uh, so John, you're gonna have to go back and listen to this. Uh, we just covered that a few minutes ago. And the quick summary is because of engineering design and how does it affect Super, perform Super Hornet performance? It degrades it. Okay, what do you think of the progress of the Russians, Chinese, and indeed the Brits regarding their carrier aviation? Uh, I, I don't really know anymore. I know when I was on active duty, there was a Russian carrier that got sold to the Chinese and they were trying to get it going. I've lost touch <clears throat> of where they are, but you know, as long as we're not at a conflict with them, then hey, more power to them. Uh, we can't tell them not to, and it's a difficult process. I wish them the best as far as figuring it out without too many mishaps because it is a dangerous pastime landing on landing high performance aircraft on ships at sea. As far as the Russians go, uh, I'm not sure. And the Brits, I know, have uh, jump jet flat decks with ramps. And as far as I know, they're doing fine. But if someone wants to tighten me up on the fact that they're trying to do something with catapults for fixed wing that aren't jump, jump jets, then help me out. All right, Tony, do you ever land on the carrier with a crosswind component? Does the ship always have to steam into the wind? So Tony, the ship attempts to steer into the wind the best it can. Once in a while, the ship will have no wind to work with. And so what it has to do is make its own wind. And because the landing area is 10 to 11 degrees canted from the axis of the ship, by definition, when the ship's making its own wind, there is about 11 degree crosswind of approximately 20 knots. So all that means is as you're coming down the groove, you just have to keep making small corrections to the right and you can stay on center line and it's not all that difficult. Occasionally, if the wind is blustery, then you'll get a little bit of left crosswind or if we're in constrained waters and we can't get the wind right down the angle of the ship, then we might have a slightly from left to right or port crosswind and that's an issue as well. Thankfully, as you'll learn on future episodes that I'm working on right now of the Fighter Pilot Podcast, we have fellow pilots that are out on the flight deck watching every single landing. They're called landing signal officers or LSOs and they will help us telling us what the winds are. And if we get out of alignment, they can, using standard terminology, get us back on center line with a call for the left or to the right as required. Good question. That's not a dumb question. Hi, I'm hoping to join the Royal Air Force. This is RJ. As a fast jet pilot, I wanted to ask you how much preparation did you do before you applied to the USAF? Uh, RJ, I did not apply to the UA USAF. I applied to the US Navy and was blessed to have received a position there. So, uh, again, no denigration uh, Im imposed here or applied, implied, excuse me, to my Air Force brethren. Somehow when I was in high school, I didn't know much and I don't give myself credit for knowing much, but I knew I didn't want to join the Air Force. I, I think they're a great service. 
I just didn't see myself as an Air Force person. I was one signature away from joining the Marine Corps and I would have had a guaranteed slot in Marine Corps aviation, but I knew I didn't see myself as a Marine either. So I kept working at it until I got the Navy and the rest worked out favorably for me. So uh, anyway, just a bit of semantics there on your question. I apologize. Uh, I wanted to, so how much preparation did I do? Uh, so we just talked about that. I did as much as I recommended the other fellow do. I learned as much as I could. I asked questions. I got myself in top physical shape and I worked hard at everything I did because it comes down to performance. So good question, RJ. Jonathan, what is the strobe light on the front gear of the Super Hornet? That's different from the Wrangler. So Jonathan, when the Super Hornet showed up at the fleet, in the daytime, those landing signal officers I just told you about, what they'll do is as they're standing, let's say I'm looking that way at the at the um, next aircraft to land, well, there's someone who is also looking over here because the aircraft turned in a 180 degree turn at the last second for what the next aircraft is because we have to set the resistance on the arresting gear correctly to know what's gonna land and how heavy it is. So when the Super Hornet came out and it weighs more than the Hornet, if we didn't set it correctly, we would break the landing gear when the jet landed and possibly kill someone or crash an airplane. So they put that strobe on so that in the daytime when we look out and not we, but the landing signal officers look out and see what the next aircraft is that they know it's a super Hornet. And so they can set the, the arresting gear for that heavier aircraft. That light does not come on at night because at night we use communications and there's a different strobe light on the tail to let the landing signal officers and everybody else know what's coming down the chute. Uh, Ivan, what is the funniest airplane to fly for you? Funniest? <sighs> Probably the T-34 Mentor. When I was a student, I was of course worried about doing well and just nervous that I was going to maybe get kicked out if I did something dumb or crashed the airplane. But 10 years after training, I had a chance to fly that aircraft again and Funniest, I guess, is the word because, I, you know, it's not that we were flippant about flying it. A T-34 Mentor can kill you as quickly as any other aircraft or motorcycle or car, frankly. But just it was fun because when you got in it, you know, you, you could you could go places. Uh, you were kind of below the radar. I don't mean literally, but just, you, you know, it wasn't as big a deal when you were flying that. So you could just go out. I, I won't say goof around and break the rules, but, you know, it's a fun little airplane and you got your buddy with you and, Typically, you go somewhere for currency and proficiency. We would sometimes stop at airfields we couldn't land at in an F-18 and get a sandwich and, and come back. So uh, I'm not sure if that's what you mean, but to me, that's what comes to mind is, uh, oh, the funnest. Oh, I didn't, I didn't. I saw an I in there. Okay, funnest airplane. Probably the F-16. And that was because when I started to fly that aircraft, I'd already had 3,000 hours in the F-18. And it was just... It was new and unique. So those of you who have driven the same car for a long time and suddenly you get a new car and you know how it's just fun because everything's new and the smell and everything else, that that was what it was like for me. So to me, the F-16 was fun. Not to mention that thing was like a rocket ship. You don't have the glare, not the glare, but the uh, canopy bow like you do on an F-18. The whole canopy is one piece. So you you feel like you're sitting on the tip of a rocket being jetted through space and it's an amazing experience. Tony, thanks. John, there was an update to the flight controls for the Legacy Hornet that improved the high alpha limit of the jet. It didn't improve the high alpha limit. It was still 35 degrees. And it, I think mainly, uh, John, unless I'm missing the point of your question, it made the jet less susceptible to departing controlled flight, which early on I had several uh, do that to me. You, you'd roll and pull one way and some forces would build up and suddenly the jet would flip over on you and go the other way. And unfortunately we did lose some aircraft that way, even while I was at Top Gun in the 2000s. But for the most part now they've, they've fixed that problem. That's a good thing. How do pilots acquire their nicknames? Okay, so I'm going to refer you to episode two of the Fighter Pilot Podcast. And if you're still not sure at that point, then get back to me. How did you get yours? Um, so nobody's asked me that yet, very good. When I, when I uh, reported to my first squadron, they threw some names up on the board and, <clears throat> excuse me, they just tried some different things. You know, there were some things I wanted to be, but of course you don't get to choose your own call sign. And at some point, someone just liked the way that Jello Aiello rolled off the tongue. 
And so it was almost chachi for a while. We had a happy days ready room going, but Jello just seemed to stick. So that's how I got mine. What would I think if someone insisted on being referred to as Maverick or Iceman? It, it doesn't really work that way. I mean, the only one who can insist is an admiral or flag officer, as we talk about on that episode, and you can't argue with them. If a new guy shows up and quote unquote insists on being called that, he'll be laughed right out of the Navy. So it's usually not an issue. All right, thanks, John, for the update on Magic Carpet. We're going to, uh, we're going to again, try to get that in the future. Uh, Rune says, greetings from Denmark. Thanks, Rune, I'm half Danish. I do get there from time to time, but it's been, gosh, 10 years, I think, since I uh, was there last. The other half is Italian, hence the name. Have you ever flown at an air show? Yes, I have, a couple times. Once in, let's see, once in Jacksonville, Florida, and once in Fallon, Nevada. I was never the solo act. I was always part of like an air power demonstration where we simulate attacking the field or doing other parts of the show. Uh, and I will tell you real quickly, uh, two things that happened when I did the air show in Fallon, Nevada, about an hour east of Reno. On the same flight, two things stuck in my mind I'll never forget. One was I was flying with a good friend of mine, uh, goes by the call sign Bull, and we were doing a high-speed pass for one particular part. And if you have ever seen, there's a picture, in fact, I had it on Facebook on my uh, one of my feeds recently. There's a picture of a friend of mine, Semi, named because he was semi-sonic when they took the picture, where a cloud enveloped his F-18 as he was nearing the carrier for a high-speed flyby. And it's just this diamond-shaped cloud all around his aircraft. Because he was over the ocean at the time, there was enough moisture in the air that the shockwave of being transonic condensed the water out of the air and basically just formed a cloud right then and there. Well, the high desert of Fallon is too arid to create that. But as I looked over at Bull uh, on this particular flight as we were going by, because I was the wingman, so I was trying to keep in the right formation with him, I realized that he had that very same shockwave around the middle of his aircraft. And instead of a cloud, it was distorting the light. If you've ever seen the, the movie The Matrix, you remember when the bullets are flying by in slow motion and that little bit of weird light that are not light, but you know, the way the light rays are bent in the trail of the bullets, that's what it looked like. Or, or the heat waves coming off, off a road in, in a, on a hot day on a, on a you know, blacktop road, the, the light was refracted through that diamond shape on top of his aircraft and it made everything in the background just look different, but there was no cloud and it just burned into my mind. I'll never forget it. And then it was either that pass or a, a, neck, a pass very close to that where we were flying over and they were setting off some demolition pyrotechnics as if we had dropped them. And they set them off right as we went by. And again, I'll never forget this. So when we wear, you've seen pictures of pilots, we have our mask and we have our visor and we have our helmet. Well, there's a little bit of skin that is exposed on your cheek. And in that instant, I felt the heat from the pyrotechnics right here on the side of my face. How it, I don't know that much about thermo, thermodynamics, but how it traveled that quickly through the cockpit and onto my skin and for me to interpret the sensation just still boggles my mind, but I'll, I'll never forget it. It was pretty cool. All right. So anyway, that was from Rune in Denmark. Thanks, Rune. Uh, let's see. Okay, Miko, given your experience with both the Hornet and the F-16, which one has a better designed user-friendly cockpit? I would say they're about the same, Miko, as far as the ability to do hands-on throttle and stick. Each of them are comparable. I would say, though, the better ergonomics from just pure pilot comfort would be the F-16 because the seat is reclined, the ejection seat, at 30 degrees. However, because of that, there is some extra stress because you hold your neck forward uh, that happens at the high G's. And also that would never have worked at a carrier because you won't sit up enough to be able to see the flight deck when the nose of the airplane is pitched up. So if I had to put my money on, not money, if I had to put my uh, vote on one of them, I, I guess I would say the F-16. The seat was more comfortable and it was reclined. I felt like I was sitting in a recliner in my, in my uh, living room. What is the difference between the F-18, asks Paul, and the F-18 Growler? So Paul, it's the EA-18, so it doesn't have the letter F in it, but it was taken from essentially the FA-18F two-seat Rhino or Super Hornet. So what they did was they took off the wingtip launcher rails 
and added some jammer pods. They increased the size of the multi-purpose functional display in the back seat for the ECMO instead of WISO, Electronic Countermeasures Officer instead of Weapon Systems Officer. Um, and there are a few other differences that I'm not completely familiar with. I never had a chance to fly the Growler, but it's mostly for simplicity and, and some who fly the two will probably correct me, but for the most part, the distinction is it is, uh, it is a Super Hornet two-seater that's been modified for electronic attack. From LZ, under rough sea conditions, how do you coordinate a safe touchdown altitude during a heavily pitching deck? So LZ, if you've been here, you heard me talk earlier about the LSOs. When the uh, conditions are adverse, whether it be darkness, clouds, rain, wind, snow, or pitching deck in your example, those LSOs are your lifesavers and you buy them the first round in every port when they save your rear ends because they are out there telling you what's going on and being directive with you. Power is one call they'll make. If you need to add power to the aircraft, you don't second guess them, you add power. If they tell you to come left or right for lineup, you do that. And they are the ones who bring you down safely. And you know, when the weather's good and they give you a landing grade that you don't think you deserve, well, then you might have some, some brief, you know, ribbing or disgust or angst on your part, but boy, do they earn it back on those nights or days even when the ship is moving a lot. So it's the LSOs that coordinate it. Brian, any interesting nights around the boat that spring to mind? Yes, if you get on YouTube, look for a PBS special called Carrier, go to the Pitching Deck episode and watch about midway through, uh, watch me describe that whole situation. I was out there that night, although they used the little cameo that I have during some day footage that they showed, but in fact, I had just landed at night and it was terrifying. It was off the coast of Australia. The ship was moving a total of 40 feet up and down, 20 feet plus or minus from neutral. And uh, it's the reason my forehead is as big as it is and some of the hair that I have is gray. Yes, uh, so Brian goes on that he met a few Navy pilots in the Royal Air Force and they all said the night traps were the things that concentrated the mind the most, absolutely. So. Uh, no problem, RJ, on the Navy versus Air Force. It's totally fine. All right. John asks, have you ever done a field trap with a resting hook in an F-16A or B? We have both of those, John. Uh, no, thankfully, I never had to do that. Um, that is really a last-ditch survival measure for an F-16. You can't raise or lower it quite as easily as you can in an F-18. So generally, that was not something you did unless you absolutely had to. And thankfully, in 170 hours, I never had to. Jonathan, what was the hardest thing for you to learn when you first started out in the FA-18C? And have you seen this flight sim company, DCS, and their Lot 20 coming out? So yes, I have seen the flight sim company. They've reached out to me to help. Other people have said, hey, you should get involved. Still looking at that as a possibility, but I don't have any experience otherwise with DCS. I have helped one fella with some SOP that he put together for communications and a few other things. Uh, his name is James. As far as the F-18C goes, Jonathan, uh, the hardest thing for me was just learning everything about it because you're you're required to know everything about it. So it, it is a lot of effort to get to that point and you just have to just put forth the time and effort to learn everything there is. I'm also simulcasting with my Facebook friends and I might not have told them that I wasn't going to uh, answer their questions. So while we're waiting on yours, Mike, I'll look over and, and see who's here. Apologize to those of you in my normal audience. Let's see. Good morning from Australia. So Chuck asked, what was your longest single flight in a Hornet and how sore were you after it? Uh, Chuck, that was over Iraq and it was probably about six and a half hours and you get a little sore. You, uh, you've got the G suit. If you remember from that one episode, you can push the button to massage your legs a little bit. But when you get out of that, you're, you're definitely sore because you, you can't get up while you're in a seat for that long. And it was probably more like seven hours because you have to start up 30 minutes prior and then after you land, you move around on the flight deck until they get you done. All right. Ryan asks, how often do pilots refer to the F-18EF as Super Hornet versus Rhino? Is it often? Yeah, they're interchangeable, Ryan. We just, whatever comes to mind. At the ship, we will use Rhino. We don't use the word Super Hornet there. Uh, for example, on night landings, we'll talk about all that on upcoming episodes. But for the most part, we just call it the Rhino. All right, Mike, I'll come back over to yours real quick. Did you fly the F-5E Tiger? Did you like the jet? No, John, I didn't. Uh, I had a friend, who, a good friend, who was the commanding officer of the squadron. We kept talking about it. I was right there next to him on the, on the ramp. 
kept trying to get a backseat ride just so I could add it to my list of aircraft, which I've got, gosh, at least a dozen different aircraft. And it just never worked out. So unfortunately, um, no, never flew the F5E Tiger. I did like it though, best I could tell, uh, just fighting against it. If you went head to head with an SU-30 and an F-18, what would your tactics be? Uh, Paul, great question. My tactics would be to, if this was training or combat, I guess for that matter, would be to take the first shot before getting shot. Uh, I know that's not what you're asking, but I don't wanna really go into much more than that. First off, because my information is probably outdated. My Top Gun friends would come take my patch away if I did get it uh, wrong. But even if I did get it right, then I've committed a security violation of talking about tactics and I'm still on the hook until the day I die. So I don't wanna spend time in prison if I don't have to. And so there, there are some game plans that are what, what a fighter pilot would do in an F-18, but I will respectfully decline that one. Thank you. Did you ever go up against a typhoon? Asks Anglo Virtual. Uh, no, I didn't. I wish I had. I think that would have been really exciting. Jonathan asks, did you ever want to be XOCO? Yes, I did, Jonathan. Unfortunately, that was not in the cards for me. Uh, the Navy had other needs and didn't align with mine. So I did my best in the other capacities that I could. But no, my services were never required as an XOCO. And hence, uh, that's why I was no longer afforded any upward mobility to a point and retired as a commander uh, after 25 years. All right, Tony, when you land on a conventional runway, do you flare the aircraft? Yes, absolutely. Now, if you're doing field carrier landing practice, which is carrier type landings at the field to get ready to go out to the carrier, then you don't flare, you just do a normal landing and you smack down kind of hard. But for the most part, you uh, if you're doing any other landing, and certainly in my current gig as an airline pilot, yes, uh, we do flare. And when I get harder landings, it's nice because I can just blame it on being a former Navy carrier pilot. All right, a couple more minutes. Uh, Mike asks, did you ever perform the pirouette maneuver in the F-18? If so, did this help you get an advantage position in ACM? Yes, I did. Uh, it was a quite good maneuver. It, and for everyone who's wondering, it's almost like a hammerhead stall. If you've ever been to an air show and watched one of the propeller performers do that, they do it quite frequently. A pirouette maneuver allows you to rapidly reposition your aircraft and the nose. And it was very useful when the, your adversary was below you. If he was above you and you did that, well, then all you did was turn your six o'clock to him and that usually didn't work out too well. Yeah, no problem, Paul. I appreciate you uh, letting me off the hook, thanks. What aircraft do you fly now in your airline job? I fly the Boeing 717 or 717. It's like a glorified DC-9 that Boeing bought and upgraded the flight deck. And it's nice because it doesn't go very far, so I don't like to sit for very long. Uh, about two and a half hours was my most recently long trip and that was from Seattle to Phoenix. Carries 110 passengers. All right, all right, we're down to about two minutes. And Mike, I think I got your point there. Let me just make sure on my guys over here. Um, and we'll have to do another one for everyone on my, hey Scott, good to see you buddy, hope you're doing well. Uh, let's see, what is the process like for a Naval Aviator NFO to become a JTAC and complete a tour as one? All right, so this will be our final question. So JTAC again is the person who's a joint terminal area controller. And that is a process of ground school. And then if you want to be a FAC A, several flights, about a, close to a dozen, and it takes several months and a lot of training. So it is definitely a convoluted, I shouldn't say convoluted, that's a negative connotation to it, but it is a, a an in-depth process, Devin. Uh, thanks for that question, very good. All right, so Mike, I'm going to uh, give a little send off here and then I'll stick around for one last second. But again, every time I turn the audio on to hear you, it creates this weird loop. Um, but I appreciate the opportunity to be here. I appreciate the great questions, everybody. Uh, this has been a lot of fun. This is why I do it, because I know there's people out there who enjoy it, and I enjoy sharing. I served freedom-loving people in the United States and all over the world for 25 years, and for me, this is another way to serve. And so I'm appreciative of the fact that people respect this and enjoy it, so I'll keep doing it. Uh, my website is fighterpilotpodcast.com. It's all one word. Uh, the show can be found anywhere you can find podcasts. That's on iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, Google Play, and there might be others, but that's what comes to mind. And we have a Facebook profile or page, I should say. We have Twitter. We have Instagram. We're all over the place. Uh, email is questions at fighterpilotpodcast.com. And we have a listener line. It's in the U.S. It's 877-MACH, M-A-C-H, 
101. That's 877-622-4101. So by all means, reach out to us, say hello, ask a question. You might hear it on the show. And with that, again, I want to thank you. And Mike, I'll stand by here for a second. I'll unmute and see if you got anything else. Okay, so that was absolutely brilliant. And um, as you can tell, Vincent was very thorough with all his uh, answers. So I hope you all enjoyed that. And um, yeah, I just want to thank Vincent personally for coming on and uh, hope you guys have enjoyed it. But uh, same from your brilliant questions, uh, maybe we can get them on again, which I'm sure we probably can because he obviously has said he loves doing these, which was uh, which is good for all us guys. I'm just going to put up his links via our our chat which you'll see in community and you can check them out via his website or wherever else he said so thanks very much for coming guys